Thank you, Hope. Uh, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar called Detection Limit Concepts According to Curry. Uh, my name is Henrik Passion. I'm a senior research scientist with Marian Technologies. Uh, in my, for my background, I've had a, a master's in physics and a PhD in uh, nuclear physics from uh, Uppsala University in Sweden. I worked for the company for over 10 years, and I worked mostly with the uh, gamma spectroscopy software. And when I set out to uh, do a webinar on detection limits, I decided on that I will go with the fundamentals, which was very nicely laid out by Lloyd A. Curry from NIST in his uh, landmark paper in 1968. And there are many other uh, work done on detection limits after this, uh, which I unfortunately will not have time to discuss. So we're sticking with, to the, the basics uh, today. So one of the fundamental questions you want to ask uh, yourself when you're doing a measurement is, is there something there? So here we see a, a spectrum from a, a from a HPG detector, and we're looking at the region around cesium-137. And the question is, is there something there? And we're going to discuss this in more detail uh, during this webinar. The radioactivity is uh, decay is a random process, and our measurement equipment is not perfect. So we can determine that a signal or a nuclide is present. However, we cannot necessarily determine that a nuclide is not present. It can always be a very small amount uh, present that we're not able to detect. So if, if a nuclide is determined not to be present, we should be able to give an upper limit on the amount present. And the nuclide is not seen, therefore the activity needs to be uh, below a certain value. And we should also be able to determine the performance of our measurement equipment. With this measurement set up, what level of activity can I expect to find? As I said, in uh, 1968, uh, Lloyd A. Curry from NIST published a set of definitions and limiting levels for determining if a signal is present and the equation for calcul calculating these limits. And before this, uh, he published his paper. There have been many different kinds of definitions and ways of calculating it, and they were not very consistent. So there was uh, definitely a need for standardization. And his paper became the standard for reporting a lot of industries it's still used today, and a lot of the more recent uh, development are based on these uh, levels. <laughs> So Curry introduces three limiting levels, one uh, LC, or the critical level, which is the net signal level that uh, if we observe a signal that's larger than this, this level, we will say that it is detected. There's a detection limit, or LD, which is the true net signal level, which may be a, a priori expected lead to lead to a detection. And we have a quantification limit, LQ, which is the level at which a measurement precision will be satisfactory, satisfactory for quantitative determination. And Curry also defines an upper limit for a signal that has not been detected. So I use this word a priori, and there's uh, also a word a posteriori. And I usually t uh, like to see a priori is something that we can say before we've done something. So it's something that we reason about before we do a measurement. And a posteriori is something that we can say from observed fact. So that's something we can say after we have done uh, the measurement. A couple of more definitions. So we have a blank. Uh, and this is defined as the signal resulting from a sample, which is, in principle, identical to the sample of interest, except what we're looking for is not present. So this blank can then include effects of interfering species. So this blank has a limiting true mean, uh, which we generally don't know. It also has an observed value, and that is what we measured. 
and this observed value has a standard deviation or an uncertainty. We also have a, a gross signal, which has a limiting mean, which again, we typically don't know. And we have an observed value, which is this, our signal uh, plus the observed value from the, or plus the blank. And this has a, also has a standard deviation. And then we have our net signal, uh, which is the, uh, the gross, so the signal plus the, uh, the blank minus the blank. So, uh, and this also has an uncertainty or a standard deviation. So when we uh, think of detection, we need to think about two things. Uh, so after we have made our measurements, we have an observed signal or a net signal, and we have to decide whether this is a real signal that has been detected uh, or if it's just from the, from the blank. The other uh, aspect is that given, given our measurement process, we uh, estimate the minimum true signal, which uh, we expect to yield a large enough observed signal that it, we will detect it. So this first aspect re relate to the a posteriori binary uh, decision based upon the observation and the definite criterion for detection. This is what we should use to determine if our signal is present or not. And the second aspect relates to the a priori estimate of the detection capabilities of a given measurement process. So this means that we, uh, how big of a signal do we expect uh, to uh, detect with our uh, detection system? And we're usually interested in activities or activity concentration of nuclides in our sample at some point in time. However, the detector measures the energy deposited by radiation in the active volume of the crystal. So this is not, uh, we have to relate these two to each other. And at least in gamma spectroscopy, uh, we determine the number of counts in peaks, and that's our signal, and we apply a correction factor to get the nuclide activity which could be your efficiency, decay correction, uh, intensities, and whatever you do to convert from uh, count to activity. And for other types of uh, measurements uh, with radioactivity, it's done similarly. You may not have peaks, but uh, the same fundamental uh, way apply. So first we, uh, look at how we determine the signal and its uncertainty. So in, uh, in Genie, uh, which I'm gonna do uh, most of my uh, examples from, we calculate the peak area. Uh, so, well, there's actually two methods of doing it. I'm gonna use the counts above continuum. And we say that our signal is the total number of counts in our, our uh, region of interest. Uh, minus our continuum. So we can see here that our continuum is the more or less flat uh, number of counts, and then we set a peak on top of it. And we can apply, if we have this equation, if we apply the uncertainty propagation formula, we come up with a uncertainty of the signal and the uncertainty uh, of the gross number of counts is uh, just the square root of the number of counts. So we have to determine our continuum, and uh, I'm gonna use this linear continuum because uh, it's the easiest one to work with. And the uh, continuum can be described by this equation, so it depends on the number of uh, channels and their contents on the side of the ROI and the number of, of, uh, of counts in our ROI. So these are these numbers. Uh, and we can apply an uncertainty propagation formula again, uh, which is standard, and we, get, we end up with an uncertainty 
of our signal to be this expression here. So let's uh, uh, let's look at this a little bit more detail. So assume that we want to know if cesium-137 is present in our sample, and then we have to ask our question: Is there a peak present at 661.7 keV? And to do that, we can calculate the size of the signal at at this, this energy. So here I show a part of the spectrum around the energy of cesium-137, and this spectrum here I generated by simulation. So I just took for every channel, I draw a random number from a Poisson distribution with a mean of 10. So this really is a flat uh, continuum, uh, and there is no peak here. I know this for a fact since I generated this. Uh, spectrum. However, we can still calculate the size of the signal uh, at this energy. So if we do this uh, and we use the formulas that I just described, uh, we see that this is our ROI for the, uh, for the peak. We use these channels on each side to estimate our continuum, and we use the formula to calculate the signal and the uncertainty, we get a signal of 42 and an uncertainty of 22.18 counts, or 50, almost over 50%. So the question now becomes, is this a real signal or just statistical fluctuations of the continuum? Well, let's repeat the measurement, see what we get. So if we do a second measurement, now, I still did a simulation, so I did exactly the same thing, draw to random numbers for each, each channel, and this time uh, we came up with a spectrum that looked like this, with the, this ROI, these uh, uh, counts on the side of this ROI. And if we apply the same formula, uh, we get a signal of minus 10 and an uncertainty of, of uh, 22. So we can see that the signal is negative. That's uh, that's perfectly fine because it's uh, you uh, we draw uh, it's a random process. And if we would repeat this, we can make histogram of the distributions of the signals from these measurements. So I draw the first two here. We got our 42. So we added one to the bin of the signal at 42, and we have the uh, signal at minus 10. So let's repeat this many times. And since I do uh, did this with simulations, it's very easy to repeat this. You just tell the computer to do this many times. So I told it to do it 100,000 times. And I'm not saying that anyone should do this with measurements, but I did this to illustrate uh, uh, these concepts. If we do the same measurement, we draw a random number, so we get a flat continuum 100,000 times, and we calculate the signal at the same energy, we get a distribution that looks like this. So we can see that it's centered around zero, which is exactly what you expect since there is no signal there. And the probability of calculating a signal goes down the further from zero you go, so it goes down further you go. And we can calculate a standard deviation, which turns out to be 21.9, and the 95 percentile, which is 36, or around here. So the 95th percentile means that 95% of the measurements had a signal that is below this number, below 36. So let's remember those uh, for later. And also, yeah, it ra ranges from about minus 80 to 80. What if we add a small real signal? So I did the same thing. I generated the spectrum with the uh, draw random numbers uh, in every channel. And then I injected a small amount of 
count, extra counts in these, this area at uh, close to cesium-137. So we can, cal we can again calculate the size of the signal, and here it shows uh, the area around 661.7 kV, and this is the, our continuum estimation from these channels, and these are the number of counts in the ROI. And this time we calculate a, si a signal of 59 and uh, uncertainty of 21.6, or about 36%. So we can do this many times too. Uh, I did this again 100,000 times. And if we do that, we um, get a signal, a distribution of signals that we observed signals that look like this figure here. And it ranges from around zero to around 150, and it centers around 75, so it's shifted from from the uh, background or the uh, zero signal with about 75 counts, and that is actually the amount of counts that I put in in the uh, in the spectrum. And we can see that the width is slightly larger, but not that much. And and we can see that the uh, So uh, now, having this, if we measure an unknown sample and calculate the peak area to be 35 counts, so is it a real signal or just fluctuations from the continuum? So when we look at to determining if the signal is real, uh, we, we have two hypotheses. One, the signal is uh, from the blank, or two, the signal is real and we need to test which is most likely. When we do this, it's possible to make two errors. You can decide that the signal is present when it's not, and we call, it, we call this a false positive, and typically we know that the amount of errors that we can tolerate uh, of this kind uh, as alpha, or two, we can decide that the signal is not present when it actually is. And we call this a false negative, and we have to decide uh, how often we can tolerate to make this uh, this error. Uh, and you usually call that probability uh, beta. Uh, so remember the calculation of the observed signal from the 100,000 measurements. So I have this uh, distribution here again. And then we can introduce a critical level, which is just what Curry did, um, which is the size of the signal where one minus uh, alpha gives the correct answer, which is not detected. And we, uh, we um, can introduce this equation for the critical level. So it's the K alpha, so this is the amount, uh, this is a factor that relates to the amount of times we can tolerate to make the, the error and say that the, uh, the signal is present when it's actually not. And this other, term, uh, this other factor here is the uncertainty of the zero signal. So if we look at the figure here, the uncertainty uh, is basically the width of this signal, of this distribution, and the K alpha relates to how far out on this distribution we have to go in order to say that the, uh, the uh, signal is real. So if we want to be more sure that the signal is, uh, is real, we have to go further out on this distribution and increase our K alpha. But this also means that we will uh, the, the, it's small it's harder to detect small signal. And uh, in, Curry envisioned this, uh, this level to always be in count, because you, you do a, you calculate your signal in count, and then you compare it to uh, this, re this uh, level, so it should be in count.
what about the a priori detection limit? So uh, the detection limit is defined so that the probability distributions of outcomes and the true signal is at the detection limit intersects our critical level that we defined in the previous slide so that the fraction that correspond to the correct decision detected uh, is one minus beta. So beta is again, how often can we tolerate to make the uh, decision incorrectly to say that the signal is not present when it actually is. So uh, our detection limit is our critical limit plus uh, this factor k beta, which relates to how often we can tolerate to make this error times the uncertainty of the, uh, of the signal when it's at the uh, detection limit. So I have plot, here I've plotted these two uh, distributions on top of each other. So this uh, blue curve here is the uh, zero signal. The uh, orange curve is the uh, signal when we had 75 counts as a true value. And that just, just happens to be the critical level. So we can see that these two intersect uh, at, at the critical level here. So this means that these uh, times we measure the, the blank or the zero signal, sometimes we will make the decision that it is detected when it's not. And if we have a sample which has a true signal at the detection limit, these number of times we will make the incorrect decision that it is not present. So in other words, the LD is the smallest true signal possible that the measurement system will detect with a certain probability of uh, uh, making the wrong decision that the uh, signal is not present when it actually is but also at the same time having a set uh, probability of incorrectly determining that a true signal of zero is present. Uh, Curry also defines an upper limit. So if the observed signal is less than the critical level, we should decide that the signal is not present and we should report an upper limit, which is the measured signal times a one-sided confidence level times our uncertainty of the signal. This doesn't necessarily mean that the signal is not present. It just means that the observed signal was not large enough that we would mine one minus alpha probability say that the signal was not from the blank. And if the observed signal is larger than the critical level, uh, the decision detected should be, should be reported. And we should state an interval based on the, of the signal based on the confidence level, which should be the signal times k gamma times the uh, uncertainty of our signal. So this means that with one minus gamma certainty, the true signal is within the confidence interval. If we look at the a distribution of possible outcomes, uh, if we measured 75, the, the uh, sigma of the signal is the, again the width of this distribution and, and k gamma is how certain do we wanna be that the true signal is within what we state. So if we increase this k gamma, we go for, can go further out on this distribution. So if we say that this is one, 
that means that uh, we we claim an confidence interval plus one is y minus one sigma, and that means that the true we say that the true uh, true signal is within our level or our confidence interval with 68% uncertainty or with 68% certainty. So that means that about one third of the time the actual signal is outside of the confidence level. Uh, so that's why someone we might want to increase this so that we get a higher confidence that the signal is within what we report. So the last uh, of the three um, three levels is the quantitative analysis, and it it may not be satisfactory to have a decision that the signal is present or not with an upper limit or a wide confidence interval. So, for instance, if we measure norm, we know that to, in the soil sample, we know that that most of these norms are present. So just to take the, determining that it is present or not is not really satisfactory. So uh, we want to know the size of the signal that might give a, a relative standard deviation that is smaller than a value of Q. So we can therefore define a determination limit, LQ, for which the uncertainty is smaller than Q and where 1 over Q is the required uh, KQ is the required relative standard deviation. We have this expression. So this is a good time for questions, if we have some. So the question is, what are some examples of K gamma? So uh, what um, what people might use is uh, one, and that would mean that it's uh, that's what I mentioned. It's that uh, it's within one standard deviation. So that means it's uh, about 68% uh, certain that the the, sig the true signal is within the uh, level that we uh, that we quote. Some other values might be two, which means that we're close to 95% certain that the uh, that the true signal is within the limit that we quote. Question is the one sided confidence level is in the percentage case 95%? So, 95%, uh, the one sided confidence interval is just meaning that, uh, that all the possible outcomes is either below or above uh, this value. And the most typical value to use is 95%. So, if you say that uh, for your critical level, for instance, you can tolerate a five, uh, that you're wrong 5% of the time. This is the mo by far the most common value. And uh, if people don't state anything, it's assumed to be uh, that the alpha is 5%, which means that it's a 95% uh, one-sided confidence interval. So the question is: Is it is it correct to say that uh, that to have 95 uh, percent we have uh, 1.96 standard deviations? And yes, that is correct. Uh, but that's a two-sided confidence interval. Uh, you have to be within uh, 1.96 standard deviation. So the question is, uh, but we can't have a negative number of counts, and uh, the um, 
the answer is yes, we can have a negative number of counts because what in principle we're doing is subtracting two numbers that have an uncertainty on them. And uh, when you do this, you can have a negative number of counts. However, we cannot have a negative activity. That is a correct. We cannot have a negative activity. And the Curry formulation does not deal with this. Later developments in, uh, in detection limits, like the ISO 11929, does deal with this. Uh, but I don't have time to go into more details on this particular, uh, on the ISO 1929. All right, so that's all the, the questions we had time for uh, right now. There will be more questions at the end, so please uh, continue sending uh, questions. So if we want to apply this to gamma spectrometry, uh, so if we look at the critical level, uh, so the critical level depends only on the uncertainty of the zero signal. And if we look at the variance of the net signal, we, uh, we see we have this uh, equation here. But we know for the zero signal that the this, uh, this signal is zero. So therefore, we can say that the variance of the zero signal is uh, blank plus the uh, uncertain number of counts from the blank plus the uncertainties uh, or the variance of the blank. So now we can write an expression for the critical level. So this is the K alpha times sigma naught or sigma zero. So this is K, K alpha uh, times the square root of uh, our count from the blank uh, times the variance of the blank. So again, the um, this uh, uncertainty of the zero signal depends on the width of this distribution that you, that you get from, uh, from measuring the blank. Uh, and K alpha relates to how far up on this distribution we want to go to say that uh, we, are, uh, we have detected. This relates to the width. And K alpha relates to how certain you want to be that a signal is, uh, is present when we make that decision. So the detection limit, uh, it's defined as our critical level plus the K beta, which is the how certain we want to be that uh, a true signal at the detection limit will, will give the correct uh, outcome being detected. So uh, we can write it as, uh, if we use the definition of K alpha from before, we can write it as this. And again, we can see a more a representation of these two values here. And I have used that the K alpha is, or that alpha is 5 and beta is 5. Uh, 5%. All right, so uh, in order to get a number on this, we need to know what is the uncertainty at the critical level or, or at the detection limit. So the variance when, uh, when the signal is at the detection limit, we can write uh, as this formula here. So this means that we can write we write our first expression to be this expression here. And we can use that sigma zero is the critical level divided by K alpha. And if you do some, uh, some math on this, which I leave up to you to do, uh, we come up with this expression here. So this is the, uh, the most general ex expression when uh, when we assume when we don't make any assumption on what the k alpha and k beta are a very common case is to say that k alpha is equal to k beta 
and uh, with an alpha and beta of 5%. So then the, this formula reduces to uh, that the detection limit is k squared times 2 uh, plus 2 times the critical level, or k squared plus 2 times uh, k and the uh, uncertainty of the zero signal. Note that we have a k-squared term, which means that there is a minimum value that the detection limit can have, even if we have zero as the uncertainty of our, our zero signal. We do the same with the quantification limit. Uh, we want to be able to determine the activity of a nuclide with 10% relative standard deviation. Uh, we said that our KQ is equal to 10. Uh, we get L, uh, this expression, which we can solve for LQ, and we get end up with this final uh, expression here. Uh, if we're going to go into some examples on how this is done in uh, Genie, uh, so for the calculation of the critical level is actually done in two different ways, and it depends on if the software found a peak uh, or if it did not find a peak at this energy. Or uh, if the peak has been found, uh, the continuum is estimated from the channels immediately to the left and right of the region of interest. So this is the way that I showed previously. If the peak has not been found, the continuum uh, are simply the counts in the region of interest. And the region of interest is determined during the peak area analysis for peaks that has been found. But what about region of interest for peaks that were not found? So the question then becomes, how do we determine the size of the region of interest if we're looking for a signal uh, at 661.7 keV? So uh, we know from our shape calibration the expected full width half max at the energy of interest. And if we assume that we have a Gaussian shape peaks, we can relate the width of the full width uh, of the Gaussian to the full width half max. And there's and the full width half max is 2.335 times the width of the Gauss Gaussian. So this means that we have, an, if we use an ROI that is plus minus one full width half max, we would use a width of two point, or a size of the ROI that's 2.335 times the width of the Gaussian. So, and this will cover about 98% of the expected counts from a peak at that location. So some common values for ROI width are 0.85 full width half max, which is close to two times the, the uh, width of the expected peak, uh, expected uh, of the Gaussian of the expected uh, peak shape. And that will cover about 95% of the expected counts. Another common value is 1.25 full width half max, which is a little bit uh, below uh, three times the width parameter, which will cover about 99.6% of the expected peak counts uh, for a peak in that region. And as a note of caution, you should not make this too small, because uh, then you, there could be counts from the peaks outside the region, and this could lead to incorrect results. So if we look at that, is how much of the peak it will cover. So this shows a Gaussian function with a mean of zero and a width of one. So if this would be the what our peak would look like, if we use 0.85, we will cover this region of the peak. If we use 1.25, we will cover this much of our peak. If we use a too wide area, we would just add too much count to our continuum and our critical level and our uh, detection limits will go up. 
So if we go back to our previous uh, examples, we can see that uh, the number of, this is the first example I did. So the number of counts just in the ROI, just the sum over all the counts in every channel. And it, in this case, it turned out to be 193. And if we then assume the 5% uh, full positive rate, and our K is 1.645, and our critical level becomes 32.3. But what if we have detected a peak there? So now we have to use this other, uh, this other formula, uh, which is the same way that I calculated the signal before. So this is our continuum. Uh, we have the uncertainty of the variance of the continuum. So in this case, the uh, critical level becomes 34.9, which if we remember what the 95 percentile was, uh, is 30, 36, this is a very good estimate. That means that we can, it is a pretty good estimate to just do one measurement. You don't have to make the 100,000 that I did uh, to illustrate this. So just by do, doing one measurement, we got a, a pretty good estimate of the critical level. So this again is the, uh, the distribution of the measured signals when we had uh, of the observed signals when we had no signal present, and uh, the values 32 and 34, five are pretty good estimates of the 95th percentile of this distribution, which is exactly what we wanted it to be. Uh, so what about the detection limit? So if we want to calculate the detection limit for the same measurement, we can accept a 5% false positive rate and a 5% false negative rate. We uh, insert these numbers into uh, our equations. And if we estimate the continuum from the counts in the ROI, we get 67. And if we estimate the continuum from the channels next to the ROI, we get 77.8. And what turned out to be, if you use the actual uh, standard deviation from this distribution, get it at 75. So the, our estimate of 77.8 is a very good estimate uh, when we use the same way of calculating the uh, zero signal as we did in these two cases. So Curry says that the decision level or the critical level needs to only be known in counts and just this is because we uh, we calculate our signal in counts. That's uh, we only need to know this in in counts. There's of course no, nothing that prevents you from uh, from uh, turning this into activity if you want it. Uh, and this is very often the the case you want to do with the detection limit. It is very useful to know what level of activity that we would, with 95% confidence, be detected for the measurement procedure. So this conversion is typically done with the calibration factor relating to the detector response. So in, in this case, we have efficiency, we have our counting time, we have intensity and decay correction. And we can see that uh, if we use this, um, formula here, uh, we can see that the continuum increases, and we know that the continuum increases linearly with time, and the continuum is under the square root, and we have a one over the time uh, factor. So this means that the MDA decreases as one over the square root of time. So if we want to get a reduction in our detection limit, uh, calculate, converted to activity by a factor of two. We have to increase our measurement time by a factor of 
four. So this uh, quick summary is that the critical level is the net signal level above which an observed signal may be reliably recognized as detected. The detection limit is the true net signal level which may be a priori expected to lead to detection. And the first quantity should be used to determine if the real signal is present or not. The second is something that we know ahead of time uh, and should tell us how large a real signal needs to be so that the observed signal will be classified as detected with one minus beta probability while a zero signal would only result in detected with a, an alpha probability. And you should not use the detection limit to determine if the signal is present or not. And if the signal is determined to be present, the value of the signal plus the confidence interval should be reported. And if the signal is not determined to be present, an upper limit should be reported. So the last section is how to apply this in Gini. If you want to do the 95% critical level test, this is selected in the peak area calculation step. This is the setup box or setup dialog of the peak area, and there's a checkbox which says crit in the 95% critical level test, and you just check this box. So that means that we support a value of alpha that is 5%. And this is, uh, in practice, this is the only value that uh, anyone is using. The only thing you need to do is check this box here. And how to report a detected signal with a confidence interval. So if you use uh, nuclear identification with interference correction, it calculates the activity or activity concentration and the one sigma uncertainty. You want to report a different confidence uh, interval, you can set, set that up in the report. So there's a, in the report setup, there's an error multiplier, and this error multiplier corresponds to the K value of the confidence uh, interval that you want to use. And here we have an example report, so it has uh, weighted mean activity and, and weighted mean activity uncertainty. And it says here uh, that the errors are quoted at one sigma, so that means that the K gamma is one. And if you want to calculate the uh, detection limit, it's calculated under detection limits, CARI MDA. And it's always calculated in, in units of activity or activity concentration. And edible parameters are confidence factor, the ROI width, and variable MDA constant. And I would recommend you to change the ROI width from the default. So the default is around uh, four or with half max, which is pretty large. And these variable MDA constants uh, comes from this equation here. So you can see that you have uh, k squared plus 2k times uh, the uncertainty of the zero signal. So these are the actual values that, if you check this box, these are the values that will be used for k squared and 2k. And here's an example report from the, uh, from the nuclide MD, uh, MDA report, and it cap Gini calculates the detection limit for every line and uses the lowest value as the nuclide uh, MDA. And for non-identified nuclides, the activity column is the observed signal recalculated into activity or activity concentration. And the upper limit would be the activity plus K times the activity in. My final slide is the two, uh, my two most important points uh, for this webinar is uh, if you want to determine if the signal is present or not, you should use the critical level 
to determine this. And the detection limit is a performance measure of the detection system. That is, how large does the signal have to be for me to be able to detect it with 95% probability? And it should not be used to determine if a signal is real or not. We have time for some uh, more questions. Question is, can you speak to the use of value relative to the standard deviations to determine detection? For example, if the value is twice the standard deviation, it's a detection. Um, well, this is a, a different way of uh, trying to determine if a um, the signal is present or not, and it doesn't really relate to the the, um, the critical level and the detection limits that we've talked to today. Uh, and actually, if you look at what the uncertainty would be at the critical level, it's actually 60% of the signal. So this would be a different way of uh, trying to determine if a signal is present or not. The question is, how does the significance threshold factor into uh, significant threshold factor into whether or not a decision above the critical level is made. Not sure I really follow question. But the uh, the critical level is what should be used according to Kari to determine if the signal is present. And the, as we said, it has two components. And one is how certain you want to be that you don't make any mistakes and saying that it's present when it's not. And the other one is uh, how much variance do you have in your, your signal. So uh, basically the the more certain you want to be, the higher your your critical level becomes. But as a, once you have determined what you, how certain you want to be, then just use that critical level and determine if it's above the critical level, it's detected. If it's not, if it's below the critical level, it's not detected. And the question is, does Genie automatically adjust the uh, critical level and the MDA equations when the number of background channels and continuum channels are different? So, uh, I'm not sure I follow this. So, Genie juices the ROI, and it has these two ways of determining it, depending on if it found a peak or not. And it uses, uh, these are the values that are used uh, when it calculates the uh, critical level and the detection limit. And it uses the same for both of them.
So the question is, does low counting statistics change any of the relationships given here? So if you have very, very low counting statistics and basically you have no, no counts at all in your ROI, it does change these a little bit um, because uh, these relation, uh, relationships were basically derived uh, assuming uh, normal distributions, which is not the case for uh, when you have very, very low counting statistics. So if you want to, if one uses uh, really the Poisson distribution, it will change the equation for the MDA and that K squared factor, which if you assume 5% uh, confidence level, yeah, becomes 2.71. If one uses Poisson distribution, it becomes uh, very close to three. So that would be the most, the biggest difference. The question is, will Gini Will Gini contain, or does it already contain? There are more recent methods with limits, including Bayesian type of a priori information, for example, non-negative activity, and there, it already does this. It, this is one of the changes that was done to the ISO 11929, and Gini has an algorithm for that complies with the uh, ISO 11929 uh, standard, and this takes exactly this into account uh, that we know ahead of time that, for instance, an activity cannot be negative. So this, uh, so yes, Gini does can take this into account. We have to use the uh, ISO 11929 uh, detection limit calculation. All right, that was uh, all the time for questions we have. Uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, attending this, uh, this webinar, and I hope that you learned something from it. And uh, I appreciate all the questions we've got. So thank you.